Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Holiday Inn, Kingston, New York. It is the 6th of October, 2006, approximately 9 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yes, uh, John L. Grogan, 11 26 24, Bronxville, New York. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Three and a half years of high school. Uh, East Chester High School, uh, Westchester, uh, in Westchester County, New York. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, vividly. I was uh, home alone listening to a New York Giants football game. Mm -hmm. uh, by radio, and uh, I remember the interrupted uh, game and the announcement that uh, that must have been in the early afternoon, uh, Eastern Time, the announcement of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Probably not. <laughs> most, yeah. most didn't. Yeah. Okay, what was your reaction to this? Well, um, I was excited. Uh, as a young man, I was, uh, my father was involved in community things, uh, the volunteer fire company and the, uh, the Board of Education. And I was always interested in politics and what was going on in the world. So when this came in, I, you know, I realized it was a very big a ticket item and, and that it would affect me, maybe, and my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I was anxious to hear about what happened, but there was very little outside of the broad announcement, you know, mm -hmm. that for, for several days or weeks, I don't know, they were always talking about, we couldn't tell too much because uh, uh, we might give uh, information to the enemy and that kind of thing. Uh, I guess as a senior citizen, I know that they also withhold information, and you know, for a lot of reasons, and certainly that was a big tragedy for our country, so mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't good news for sure. Mm -hmm. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted uh, in January of 1943, in, uh, and I enlisted in a special program I was in my senior year in high school then, and I had to take my Regents tests like in December and January in New York State uh, to more or less qualify for graduation. So mm -hmm. I did that, and I think I had a friendly science teacher who got me through the state regents. <laughs> but <laughs> in any case, I went into a uh, meteorology program, and I wanted to train people to be weathermen, mainly for the Air Force at that time. And um, there were the there was the option involved if you qualified for attending different colleges, universities that were in the program. So um, that was also an opportunity in a way to to get some college experience, although I never thought of it in that way. Mm -hmm. um, why did you select the uh, Army? Actually, the uh, it was the Army Air Force Army. program. Okay. Um, why so did you select that? Actually, um, because it was the program that was there, oh, okay. and uh, my parents were, you know, they were very concerned about the oldest son and what would happen and so on. And there was, you know, there was a lot of interest in, well, you know, well, what could you get into that would perhaps spare you from the war and so on. But uh, this program interested me, and I think it was the principal in the high school who knew about the program. So uh, I was happy to join this rather than maybe get situated in some uh, domestic army base or something of that kind, you know. This seemed to be have a challenge to it and the idea of the Air Force and, and playing a role in that was important to me. Where were you sent for your schooling? Pardon? For your military schooling, whereabouts were you sent? Uh, sent first to Bowdoin College, uh, 
in Maine, Brunswick, Maine. And uh, I was there for at least a year into probably the spring of uh, 1944, although I'm not sure about the dates, but um, they closed the meteorology program down because they said they had enough weathermen and so on. Um, I, uh, that, was a, that was a wonderful experience for me at the time Bowdoin College and you know, sort of an Ivy League kind of setting and cold in the winter but uh, challenging and I had a rather limited uh, science and math program in my education so I was challenged by calculus and vectoral analysis at that time and and you know, had to struggle, and with the help of my roommates, I, I got through the program until it closed down. Did you attend class in, in uniform? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, it was pretty much like, almost like, I suppose, an ROTC program, as kept it was regular Army mm -hmm. and Air Force, and um, there were some interesting people there, the person who taught uh, physical education at Bowdoin was Adam Walsh, who was one of the four horsemen at Notre Dame. And uh, a wonderful man and, you know, who was an inspiration <laughs> to me mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, and also the other professors, uh, you know, were marvelous and, and I think they opened up a lot of vistas for me, that is that education and uh, the, it was a sort of a, a wasp school in a way uh, mm -hmm. back in those days, and and uh, but there were outstanding uh, people who were teaching in the in the program. So I, I felt very blessed that I had had that experience, and I had wonderful roommates and from Philadelphia, New York, uh, uh, one fellow from upstate New York, another from Brooklyn and New York, and so on. And uh, that was also a, a wonderful part of my learning experience as a young person. Okay, where did you go after Bowdoin? Uh, I Bowdoin? was assigned to uh, a radio operator school in Scottfield, Illinois. Uh, and that was, I think, about a six-month program. That was sometime in 1944. And, uh, I, that was, at that time they were still using Morse code and, and so on, so we learned all about that and a little bit about tinkering with the radio system, you know, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. operator, uh, radio operator on, a, on an airplane. And uh, we had some, some experience, that, some flight experience there, uh, but not very much. And, I finished that program and, and qualified then for radar uh, training in Boca Raton, Florida. And uh, I went to Boca Raton and, and that was probably like a three or four month program, I don't remember exactly. But uh, I studied that and there was quite a bit of uh, uh, flight training uh, with the radar in that experience. and. My main, um, uh, you know, uh, drama during that experience, apart from the, uh, the heat in Florida, was uh, getting lost over Cuba uh, when I was guiding the plane and part of my training. I always remember that. What kind of plane was it that you were? It was a flying fortress. Yeah. I was trained in flying fortresses, but when I was sent over as a replacement, uh, in December of uh, 44, uh, I actually was assigned to a unit that was flying B-24s. So my first experience, uh, just prior to my first mission uh, out of Guam, uh, was uh, on a B-24, and uh, it was all new to me. You know. So uh, all of that training experience on B-17s uh, wasn't too much help. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I was sent to the West Coast uh, after Boca Raton uh, to uh, Fort Hood, I think that was in Washington or Oregon, and uh, 
boarded a ship by the name of Orizaba at that point, and this is sort of bad news for someone who would like to fly in the Air Force, but uh, I was sent over with a, you know, a shipload of mates, and uh, I think it was like a six-day trip to Hawaii, you know. And from there we got on an LST uh, type, uh, or an LSD or something that was a little bit uh, larger. And uh, went all the way down to Anyway Talk and then to uh, over to Guam. Uh, and that was, you know, first sea experience and not too bad, you know little bumpy and the first part of it, uh, I read some years later that the, uh, I don't know if it was years, but after the war the bottom fell out of the Orizaba in San Francisco Bay. So that was, you know, uh, what we were traveling in. Now when you re reached Guam you were assigned as a replacement? Yes, uh, to the uh, 7th Air Force, and I'm not sure of the unit, that was the group, it was a bombing group, uh, you know, and it was a camp, um, uh, I forget the capital of, of Guam, but it was probably not far from the capital, of an Air Force unit was stationed. No, it says on your form here, the 3508. I think that was an administrative base. Oh, okay. uh, uh, yeah, it's a base field. unit. Okay. And of course, I read that before I came, and mm -hmm. uh, I said, "Gee, I don't think I was at Truex Field." And uh, I think when I came back, I was assigned maybe to Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, uh, that was where I was sent to be discharged. I mm -hmm. guess from Greensboro. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the tie-in with Truex Field, except okay. maybe administratively, you know, mm -hmm. some connection. Now, uh, were you, as soon as you reached Guam, you were immediately assigned to this unit in the 7th Air Force? Yes, that was that was my first uh, sort of overseas uh, mm -hmm. group uh, and connection. And uh, I was there, and I wasn't assigned to a crew, so I was filling in, I guess, at that point for uh, other radar operators. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it was a random thing. Every morning you went out to check the chalkboard and, and uh, see if you were assigned and to which crew. It uh, wasn't a highly organized thing and it really had a search. It was a big board with a lot of chalk, you know, writing mm -hmm. on it and so on. And so you had to struggle to find out where you were and which crew, etc. Now, what was the difference um, being trained on B-17s and being assigned to B-24s? What was the difference between them? The uh, First of all, the location, I, I, I kind of remember having a little bit more visibility from where I was situated on the B-17. Uh, the B-24, uh, the radar uh, station, was behind the bomb bay and very much of a cubby hole, so it was sort of isolated and uh, there may have been some kind of, you know, peekable window there, but you could see virtually nothing except part of the wing when you looked out. And uh, that turned out to be, you know, kind of a scary experience because the uh, first mission involved uh, some uh, over Iwo uh, and it involved some zeros in the sky. I don't know how aggressive they were, but uh, the gunners were firing their and machine guns uh, during the first mission. And actually, uh, you have uh, written a little bit about this, but one of the exciting things that happened, and it has to do with a question that you raised, uh, was the radar operator's uh, job to go down into the bomb bay and pump up the uh, radar uh, globe that was under the plane to cut down the air resistance during the bombing run. And so I went down and I pumped away, you know, as best I could. And uh, pretty soon they were, you know, I was kept pumping and pumping, and I got it as tight as I thought I could. And I started to leave, and the crew chief says, "Keep pumping," you know. And uh, so I kept pumping, and eventually I got it uh, uh, set, you know, I got it up and set. But by that time we were 
kind of coming down, sort of on a downward uh, slant on, and at the highest speed of the bomber uh, coming over Iwo. So I had the pleasure of looking out the bomb bay doors and seeing Iwo Jima coming up, you know, very quickly. And I was waiting for the bombs to either explode or get dropped out of the bomb bay. Um, so that was kind of, and of course there was some wind coming in at that point, so I had to kind of walk the catwalk back to the radar uh, station, you know. Uh, but fortunately, uh, you know, the, the mission was uneventful in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, they dropped their <coughs> bombs. They called it a, one of the milk runs from mm -hmm. Guam, you know. And now, did, did you wear a flight suit? Uh, yes, yes, a flight suit and uh, I think I had a Mae West that I, since we were flying mm -hmm. over, I think I wore that. Uh, did you wear a flak jacket also? or and a flak jacket, yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you wear a parachute or was that on the floor that next was, to you? That was uh, nearby, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, um, anyhow, and the second mission uh, from Guam, I, I came back, by the way, and I, I slept. And it was one of those deals where uh, somehow I lost a day. You know, and I, I couldn't imagine that, you know, I, I must have skipped Sunday or something like that. It was Monday next time I went out. And uh, the second mission was <clears throat> sort of eventful in the sense that uh, we were, you know, I did my thing. We, they had a navigator on board, so finding Ewa was not a big deal, but you could the rad they asked for confirmation on the radar and we'd give them the location uh, by the clock, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as to, in reference to the plane, what uh, point on the clock the island was located at and what the distance was and so on. And the radar at that time on the B-24 was not the latest radar they had, but it was pretty good. It was a sea-oriented uh, sea radar and very uh, efficient, I thought. And uh, so we got very close to the island in uh, that mission, and uh, just before we went into a bombing run, the captain announced on the radio that uh, the commander down in the naval ships below uh, asked that we not proceed with a bombing run, because I could see on my screen there were ships, all sorts of ships, uh, mainly south of Iwo Jima that were filled with Marines, I guess, and, and they were probably going to start shelling pretty soon. And uh, so they didn't want us dropping any bombs in the area, you know, in the event that one should go astray and mm -hmm. there, there, someone would be killed by friendly fire, that kind of thing. So we dropped our bombs on the way back, I guess, into the ocean, and, and uh, that was exciting and it was important, but it, it wasn't uh, the typical mission. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you mean by the radar was a sea-oriented radar? Well, there were a lot of different uh, kinds of radar operating at that point, and this radar was oriented towards water and uh, uh, whatever uh, electronic uh, sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I trained in the radar, I did fly over Cuba, um, and um, you know, you could point out some sort of populated areas, you get more feedback on the radar screen from those. Um, but the, I don't know whether it was uh, lesser uh, sensitivity or greater, but they always distinguish between the, that particular radar. I don't forget the number of it, but they call it a C-oriented uh, mm -hmm. radar. Okay. Uh, it had to do probably with the physical electronic feedback, uh, the difference between land and, and mm -hmm. water. And of course, uh, anything you would see on the water would stand out more than it might on the land, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those were your only two missions that you had? That's right. What did you do the, the rest of the time while you were on the base? Uh, actually, uh, not a great deal. I didn't travel on the island uh, to visit uh, towns or villages or anything of that kind. We drove through them a number of times. A very 
a very beautiful island, uh, very primitive in terms of the natives and so on. Did you have any uh, problem adapting to the climate of, of Guam? Well, uh, yes, the heat and the sun uh, were pretty extreme. And in retrospect, as I, you see this band-aid here, uh, that's, I have it on for cosmetic purposes right now because I have a, a scar uh, there from basal cell carcinoma, which was sort of, uh, you know, ingrown a bit, so they had to cut a little deep around the, the skull. Uh, but the sun, uh, I think I was, what, 18 and a half, I was just, uh, uh, my birthday was, of course, uh, in, 19, in November 1924, and so I was 17 at the time of Pearl Harbor, or close to 7, mm -hmm. just two weeks past uh, 17, and then 18 during the 1944, and uh, 1945. I don't remember the exact date of the missions, but they say that um, that the damage that we all experience from the sun occurs mostly during those mm -hmm. early years. So mm -hmm. I always think about that, and I I don't have any service-connected disability, but maybe I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you ever uh, have any diseases or sicknesses while you were there? Uh, Nothing other than um, uh, back, back strain and so on. I, I don't know whether it was in Hawaii where we were. One of the things that we did in Hawaii before we went down was to load naval uh, shells. Uh, that is, the, I don't know what part of the shell it was, the powder part or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, too much about it. But we, they were on uh, trolleys, you know, uh, uh, and so we had to we had some function around that, whether it was uh, directing them or lifting them off, you know, in some fashion. Uh, so uh, that was sort of a difficult work, I would say. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, I was in the kitchen a lot in Hawaii, 13th replacement depot <laughs> near Wheeler, Wheeler Field. Now, were you on Guam when uh, President Roosevelt died? That was in 1945. Yes. Uh, I think I was probably, uh, he, well, I'm not sure. I think it was uh, April of 45. April. Yeah. Uh, that, what, what month was that? April, April of 45. I think I must have been on Guam at that mm -hmm. time. I was yeah. just wondering if you had any reaction when you heard about his death, if you recall. No, I, I, uh, I guess uh, I grew up in a, a democratic family, uh, and so uh, I admired President Roosevelt, but my father did not admire him because he felt that uh, he was an opportunist, uh, and he thought that he moved too quickly to get us into that war, and uh, and in in. Retrospect, I guess I, I, uh, I became a Republican eventually, and uh, I uh, was not too fond of uh, President Roosevelt or his party. Although I have tried to, and I, because I was interested in political and international affairs, I regretted very much that he was uh, very sick through the latter part of his presidency and. And he was representing us at Yalta and uh, other places uh, with Joe Stalin mm -hmm. and uh, Churchill. And I felt that maybe he wasn't at his best uh, mm -hmm. during that period. Mm -hmm. okay. um, do you were, remember your reaction when you heard about the dropping of the atomic bombs? I was in Hawaii, I think, when that occurred on the way back. Uh, came back by boat two, I think, from from Guam, and um, I guess I was excited and uh, not thinking too much about the terror that that mm -hmm. was for, uh, would be for any people, 
to have that experience, that total destructive burning experience. Um, so, I, but I felt that, you know, it was probably meant that the war was uh, coming to a critical point. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to see any USO shows while you were overseas or oh, yes. even in the yeah, States? I remember uh, hula dancing in Hawaii and entertainment and USO clubs uh, in this country and overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was grateful for that. They were, you know, they were a place to go and you know, especially write letters and mail letters and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When were you eventually discharged? Uh, I believe the date was November 24th, uh, 1945. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do once you came back to the States? Uh, you weren't immediately discharged, so what was your assignment or assignments? Actually, it was uh, in Greensboro, I believe, and it was not uh, particularly, it was just uh, marking time, I think, while the discharge process uh, began, you know, and that was probably just a, a month or two, I, you know, no more than mm -hmm. that, I think. Maybe even a few weeks, I don't remember. Uh, so I had, had a lot of anticipation, of course. Uh, we were sort of a close-knit family of uh, six children and their parents, and, and uh, we're just together, I guess, mainly because we were a uh, lower middle class family, uh, income-wise, and and we didn't do a lot of socializing and traveling and that kind of thing. That was another aspect of, uh, you know, being in the service, uh, traveling mm -hmm. and um, and experiencing different parts of the country and, and then overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I happened later to marry a, a girl whose parents uh, came to this country from Switzerland and France. So I had, like, again, more interest in traveling at that point and was able to do more. Mm -hmm. After you were discharged, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Uh, of course, yeah. Thank God for the GI Bill. Here I am, kind of, you know. Uh, the uh, I got out in November, and the next January I uh, went to Iona College in New Rochelle, and uh, a wonderful small college at that time with a lot of veterans uh, coming in, and it was only about six years old, uh, let me see, uh, maybe not that long, maybe a few years old at that point, taught by the Irish Christian Brothers. and. Mm -hmm. You know, they were on the ball and sharp and, you know, very good uh, education-wise. And that was a wonderful experience. Uh, I mean, I've been to Bowdoin and that was a challenge. Uh, but the uh, teaching at uh, that college and, you know, and the uh, subsistence allowance that you got along with that was, you know, that was a wonderful thing and it helped me to go on in my education. Do you ever make use of the 5220 Club? Yes. And I'm not sure whether that was like over a summer period uh, uh, or after uh, after college or during mm -hmm. a period of unemployment. I'm not sure. But that also was helpful. And uh, I guess I, was, I did mostly part-time work at that time. I worked in a Coca-Cola plant and did other things. Uh, uh, after the service, and it was a while before I uh, decided what I was going to do. I guess before I went to Iona, maybe there was a little time I worked in, and uh, and then got connected uh, when I graduated in 1950 from Iona, and I went to a graduate school at Catholic University, and my my aide, my college aide. Uh, was still operating. We'll be with you in a minute. Was still going at that point, mm -hmm. so I had help at the graduate level too. Okay. And that helped me through. Otherwise, I would not have been able to do that and to experience Washington and, 
and so on. So mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, ever join any veterans organizations? You know, I, I visited, uh, I went to meetings in veterans organizations, but uh, I don't know whether you have to be a member of the infantry or the artillery or whatever. Uh, there was a lot of uh, camaraderie, and but the, also a lot of sort of officious military kind of uh, brother so and so mm -hmm. and brother mm -hmm. that you know and that kind of thing, and that didn't appeal to me at all. And maybe I don't know if there's such a thing as being too patriotic, but there was something about it that just didn't. Uh, uh, you know, strike me well. Mm -hmm. So I, and my uh, my uncle who died in France had a, a VFW group named after him in my local community in Tuckahoe and Westchester and so on. So I had reason to be interested, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, no, I never in Kingston, New York, I, outside of visiting uh, some of those meetings and so on, I did not join. Mm -hmm. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone in, that was in service with you? Yes, uh, I, I had a fellow who uh, was in the 8th, 19th bombing group and the 8th Air Force maybe, or, or maybe that was 7th, I'm not sure. But he was eventually moved to Saipan and uh, I'm not sure, I think he may even have flown. When I was on Guam I was still seeing, uh, uh, or just seeing like the B, what was the big plane? B-29. B-29 is coming in. <coughs> And uh, of course, they used them, I guess, for the atomic mm -hmm. bomb. So uh, we were horse and buggy uh, people at that time. So, but I, I kept track with Joe Shemitz, who was uh, from Queens, New York, and who was also a radar operator. And uh, I also had, you know, one friend who died on a mission uh, over Japan and uh, went down in the I think they call it the China Sea, maybe, I don't know, between Korea and, and uh, or between Japan and Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and otherwise, uh, I guess the, uh, the only scary part of that Air Force experience was to know that, that when you were in a plane, uh, you know, it was pleasant duty in a way, it was interesting, it was technical, it was exciting, but uh, if your plane got hit by anti-aircraft fire or, or you were capable of getting blown up very quickly, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that was a different kind of a war though. I, I know a fellow on the west coast who was in the infantry and who captured that Remagen Bridge, uh, you know, and I've heard a lot of his stories and I've always had great respect for the people who are on the ground and doing that hellish uh, fighting, you know, uh, all over the world, and they, and Iwo and Saipan and Okinawa and Iniwetok and all of the other in the places in Europe. So, uh, and I still have that kind of respect, and a lot of those people are here. Mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you think your time in the service uh, had an effect or changed your life? Did it have an effect? Yes, and how, or how it changed your life. Well, um, I think it made me, uh, I was, uh, I had an uncle who was a priest, and um, it made me, um, during the service, I kept uh, loyal to my religious, you know, affiliation. I was a Roman Catholic. And when I left the service, uh, the first thing I did, I guess, was, I, and then you'll see this maybe a problem of sequence here in terms of time, but I, I met a chaplain who was, you know, in Hawaii, I think it was, and I decided at the time I left the service to uh, uh, go into uh, the CSC seminary, and it was in Massachusetts, and these were the priests who taught at Notre Dame. And I guess the idea of uh, being a missionary or, you know, being uh, a teacher uh, anywhere in the world interested me at that time. And, but I, I left that program, it must have been in 1948, and that's when I went to Iona College, and it must have been January of 1948. So that interim period, 
I was training to be a priest. Mm -hmm. And so that, I guess it influenced me that way and also gave me a sense of, you know, what a big world it was and, and the people that you meet and all of that experience, you know, uh, were so interesting and, and you certainly were a little bit more cosmopolitan and, and world oriented than you would be if you grew up in a small town mm -hmm. and stayed there. You know, so it influenced me in that way, uh, and I guess I still have some of that. But I'm, uh, I've been responsible for some community programs. I had a uh, a grandson who was killed in a DWI crash uh, locally here, and as a result of that, with the help of uh, Doris Aiken in Albany. Uh, I received a grant from the National Transportation Highway Safety Organization and studied the justice courts. Uh, and I think my, my educational background helped me a lot in that both in terms of being sensitive to the community and what was going on out there and having a problem and, and wanting to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Probably that whole wartime experience helped me to do that, and the the education that I had uh, both um, at Iona and at the School of Social Work in Washington D.C. Uh, that was important for me because mm -hmm. it did sensitize me somewhat to social problems. Mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Well, thank you for the opportunity.